accept that. When you study the best edition of Hafez today, you have to wonder, are all the azals in it by Hafez? You have to wonder, are all the baits in each azal by Hafez? You have to wonder if the order of the baits in the edition is the order Hafez intended. And then you have to wonder, are the individual words and phrases in individual baits Hafez's words and phrases? And I'm only talking about 30 years after the poet's death. In the case of Ferdowsi Shah Hamid, the first manuscript we have of the Shah Hamid dates from 1217, and that only has half of the Shah Hamid. That's 200 years. The first reliable full manuscript, complete manuscript of the Shah Hamid is from 1317. That's 300 years, which means we're never going to know exactly what Ferdowsi wrote. That's discouraging on the one hand, but on the other hand, all of these manuscripts that date before the 14th century, they are authentic 13th and 14th century manuscripts which represent what the culture thought Ferdowsi said at the time. At the same time, if you remember from childhood particular lines of Ferdowsi and hear different versions of stories, part of the reason uh, may be that uh, different manuscripts have appeared in different editions. Most of the time, the changes are for what society in a particular time thought was a very good reason. For example, there are lots of cases where women and men have an infatuation, or they get together, and maybe they're only together for one night or two, and maybe a child results, and in the days after Fair Grossi, somebody decided, maybe I should add two or three lines saying that an op-ed came. That an ad happened, that there was ad received, and that everything is okay. That doesn't hurt the Shah of it. it tells us that the culture is sensitive to particular kinds of issues. A second question, what were fair to see sources and how did he use them? There were lots of sources, but unless you're in the fair to see business, you probably haven't paid much attention to a, a basic fact, and that is, Ferdowsi essentially was using an existing, complete prose Shah Nameh, and he turned it into verse. Uh, Mr. Johani, would you read those baits which describe this from the beginning of the story of Sofa? <laughs> And from that moment, Rostam goes hunting, loses his horse, gets to Samangang, uh, meets Tamide, and the rest of the story is, as they say, history. But there's an interesting, there are three interesting words in this. One is Depan, the second is Mubad, and the third is Bepe Vandan. Uh, Mubad implies, uh, excuse me, Depan implies either the prose Shah Nameh that was at his disposal, or the kind of people who were the unofficial historians of pre-Islamic Iranian culture who, in writing, preserved those myths. The Dehans got their information from Mubad, from Zoroastrian priests, who were the preservers during the Sassanid period and later of these stories. And then this word Bebhe Vandam, according to Ferdowsi experts, means uh, the Naz in Bekishan. That is, Ferdowsi saw as his function the writing of verse based on existing stories. The second part of this second issue is, well, what did he do uh, with the material that he inherited? He couldn't change the plot of the story. Those of you who are going to be here uh, for all three days of the, um, of the teaching uh, will discover, we'll see a movie on the third day, a, a, an animation feature in which the director, uh, an Iranian who lives in England, wants to change the ending of the story of Sohrab because he preferred if Sohrab lived and Rostam died. He recognizes ultimately he can't do it, and Ferdowsi was unable to make any changes in details in the story. But Ferdowsi was able to inject personal reflections, personal views, and pieces of his personal life. And uh, as an example, we have the famous beginning 
of the story of, of Sobhav, in which Ferdowsi sets the tone and describes a, a particular attitude toward what we all know is uh, the upshot of the story. Hanan uh, Hanat. Ferdowsi experts who study such passages have reached the conclusion that in the major part of the Shahnameh, uh, Ferdowsi exhibits what we can call a Zervanite Zoroastrianism, a sort of antecedent to Mazdian uh, Zoroastrianism was the notion that there was a prime, primordial god, Zervan, who had two sons. And the two sons, one light, one dark, one good, and one evil. But in the mix, there was no free will. It was all a matter of uh, predestination, all a matter of a fatalism and a pessimism. And the experts say that this tone is part of uh, Ferdowsi's uh, description of what happens in the Shah Maman. And perhaps the influence uh, from the stories it's themselves that brought Ferdowsi to this position is the uh, special situation of the Shah Maman as a, an epic in the context of epics around the world. Most epics appear in the age after the heroic age where the great events happen. But most epics end with a victory of the culture which had the heroic age in the past. Ferdowsi's Shah Maman is special in the sense that not only is it written after the age of glory has passed, it is written as a story that ends in defeat. That is the very last story of the Shah Maman, is Yaz the III's death and the end of the Sasanid Empire, which means that a sort of fatalism has to have been part of the attitude of people if that's how the story of their, uh, their national glory is to end. Uh, pessimism and fatalism. And though most of the people here who uh, are Iranian by birth uh, are probably not fatalists, if you scratch yourself deep enough, you'll find some pessimism there. That is, with the cultural territory, and you might look at these naive Americans and wonder, why do they always think tomorrow is going to be better than today? When we know that yesterday is better than today, and tomorrow might not be uh, even as good. As for Ferdowsi's personal beliefs, uh, lots has been argued that he was a Zoroastrian, that he was more Chayamic in attitude, that he didn't have strong beliefs, he was basically a cultural nationalist. If he was a Muslim, he was a Shiite Muslim because of the Shu'u B.A. movement and the fact that Khorasan was a center for Shiite activity, which some people interpreted as being anti-Caliphate, anti-Sunni, anti-Arab. There are only uh, several lines in the whole of the Shah of Naamen which give us clear evidence of what we can say about Ferdowsi's personal beliefs. 